What's up, everyone? How are you doing? Good to see you here, Meath and Tyler and Sophia and Anders and Al Hunter and Abigail and Charles and Liam and Olivia. We got Mubot in the chat. Let's throw you 5,000 points for just being here. And you know what time it is. What time is it? So much thank you, everyone, for being here. I don't even know what I'm saying. Who knows what time it is? It is time for... Check it out. Get ready. It is time for Kahoot. We're waiting for some players right now. It is 601. 501 in Texas. 601. This take home is mind blowing. We're going to be doing a little take home help tomorrow in class. We were wondering about things like fine transformations. So if you get to the transformation stuff, maybe uh, some hints tomorrow in class. So did everyone hear what Brian said? Well, I've been back in Texas a little bit, hanging out with my wife in Texas. So what are we going to be doing tomorrow in class? Dropping some hints. Dropping a little bit of hints, talking about that fine transformations, which fine transformations is not on the test. Well, the conceptual that is. I, some good uh, Kahoot music, but we like the funk music. We like the, uh, the disco. Your tropical hen? Like it. You two here than wife. No! Go Vols right there. Mubot saying some Go Vols in the chat. We're going to give it about two, three more minutes. So remember, what is worth a good amount of points on the test? HP Pink Flamingo Boots. <laughs> nice. What do you need to, need to know how to do, which you will kind of do tonight, but not totally? Yes, interpretations. You need to know how to interpret things. What do you get for the test? Now, don't share with people afterwards if you write things on it. Well, what do you get for the test? What can you bring to the test? And I think the test is working. I had one person try to take it. And I think they said there was an issue, but it looks to be working. Let me know if there's an issue. A note sheet. So you get to have your note sheet. You get to have a cheat sheet. You get to have a front, back, printed, you name it, whatever. You can bring a calculator, your cheat sheet, a blank sheet of paper. Those are your three things. Calculator, blank sheet of paper, cheat sheet. Do those things right there. And then don't, whatever you do, don't tell people, hey, I saw this on the test. This is what's on the test. Please don't do that. Please don't do that. I don't like sending people to student conduct. I really don't like it. I don't like it. Let's just say we've had that happen with 201. <laughs> don't do it. Don't do it. Say, I took the test. I'll tell you about it after you take it. Show me your score. Oh, well, you took it? We'll talk about it now. <laughs> you and me, we took it. We talk about it. We appreciate that. That helps us out because uh, we're all, we're just trying to test everyone fairly here and see your knowledge. We'll give it about 20 more seconds, but how's everyone doing tonight? We're gonna do a lot of review right here. And I wanna say this, go grab your calculator. Go, good to see you, Reagan, and awesome. Glad you're doing well. What do you have right now? Does anyone have it out? So many GG plots, all those GG plots. Go grab your calculator at Snayatir. We're gonna put 30 seconds on the clock and start right then. Go grab your calculator. Brandon, good to see you here. Go grab your calculator. We only got a few seconds left. Go grab that calculator. You do it on your phone. Can't use your phone on the test. We lost somebody. I'm happy we got 20 people here on the night before uh, the test. I mean, the test is open now, but night before. 22 Dazzled Wildcat is back. Well, dude, good to see you here. And so get ready. Starting here in just seven seconds. Here we go. Three, I need some I'm ready's in the chat. Two, I need some I'm ready's. One, I need some I'm ready's. I'm ready's. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. Can't sing. Here we go in three, two, one. Let's Kahoot. time. Wait, final review? Wait. No. I think we got the wrong. Let me double check. Ah! Don't answer it. Two seconds. Might say I ended the code. I clicked the final code. I am sorry, everybody. Let me go back. I loaded up the final. I wasn't ready. Where is that music? Little bits. Two seconds. Plot twist. That's a final review question right there. We don't want to do final review. Okay. 
midterm midterm review okay get ready oh here we go start we're starting to short clock right here we had 23 in just a second ago okay got the real one ready plot twist over sorry you're gonna get name change here real quick okay 30 seconds log in we're starting this one a little bit quicker kind of wait we wait around to get everyone started up oh you can't see it now join on in We'll get at least 20. Sorry about that little little error right there. I was making sure everyone was ready. Now you're real ready, ready. I was like, final review. We're starting in 10 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. I'm ready this time. Here we go. Let's do it. I'm ready. Midterm review. Not final review. Starting off with some QQ plots. So get ready for the normal probability plot. The first question asks you, state your conclusion about the QQ plot for normality right here. So what do you think about this QQ plot for normality, which is in part of check regression? You'll see some check regression at the end of this because check regression is on the test. A normal probability plot is used to tell us if a distribution is normal or not normal. I drop hints while we're doing the question. So this has nothing to do with linearity. If you answered linearity, don't worry, but that's not the right answer. This only is used to tell normal or not normal. Ah, so how do we tell if it's normal or not normal? How do you tell normal, not normal from this? What is you know, this QQ plot for normality? How do we tell normal, not normal from it? How do you, someone's got to an answer in the chat here. How do we tell normal or not normal from this? Let's throw a, let's throw a 5,000 points for Brian making an error right there. Brian making an error on the wrong Kahoot, but how do we tell normal, not normal from this? How do we tell? How do you look at this and it's like, yeah, it's pretty good and normal. How do you look at this? This is a reviewer member. Yeah, it's pretty normal. It follows the line, Jackson. That's exactly it. The more it follows that line, the dots are inside. Pretty much Brandon Grant's right there, close to the red line. The red line is the perfect normal. It's not, it's kind of, it is a linear relationship, but don't think of it as like, this is linear. Um, what it is, is that's the perfect normal. Yeah, the dots are pretty close to it. And then those, those dashed lines are kind of like your eh, lines. As in like, as long as it's within the dashed lines, it's probably pretty good. It falls within the confidence bounds for what we would kind of think or kind of expect it could go outside of. So yeah, this is pretty normal because the dots are pretty close uh, to the line right there. So pretty normal, pretty normal. We'll probably see some other ones that are not pretty normal. So the only answers here for QQ plots for normality are it's normal or not normal. And I drop hints as we do the questions, so check those out. But who's in the lead right here? We got Eager Moose in the lead with Swift Condor. Ooh, it's a close game. I wonder if you can get the same points or it doesn't let you tie. $20 uh, Starbucks or Amazon, whichever you pick for first and second. So hang in there. And even if you're not winning, hang out for the knowledge. Here we go with the next question. Question number two is compute the expected value for Verizon rarely. This is where I said you needed your calculator. We are trying to compute expected for Verizon rarely. Expected is row total times column total over grand total. I'll draw it out here in a second. Expected is row total. Now answer, answer quick. If you don't have an answer, answer, because I don't think you count off for just an answering. So click an answer, and then we're going to show how to do it. I know it's a quick question. We're going to show how to do it. Row total times column total over grand total. Great. Oh, oh I think people weren't answering because they were trying to solve it. That's worth a thousand points right there. So great job. I'm happy with all the answers we got. Can anyone put the equation in the chat? It's Verizon rarely. So what is the equation? This is practice, remember. And if you don't remember these concepts for things like expected count, Verizon rarely. Uh, the, the code is down there at the bottom of the screen. If you want to join back in, the code is 3303622. And great job, Olivia, right there. Another thousand points for Olivia dropping the, and uh, Meath also, I think, doing it too. Oh, John doing it. Oh, gosh. So can't read today. So Verizon rarely. What you'd want to do here is you'd want to highlight the cell for Verizon rarely. Here's the cell. Then you take and circle the numbers. And then you multiply those and divide by the grand total. So it's row total times column total over grand total. And if you notice, the row total is the one that is over here there's the row total there's the column total and the grand total right there so great job madison meath brandon john olivia good practice right there 
And if you know how to do this, you can do it pretty quickly to get an expected sell count. Uh, we do have class tomorrow. We do have class. Yep, we got class every day. They pay me to teach, so I teach. So um, we will be covering, uh, we'll be giving some hints for the take home tomorrow. So make sure to show up. Uh, everything we've covered is on the test. We will not be doing new material, but we will be reviewing and we'll be talking about some things that are on the take home, some new concepts that are on the take home. So tomorrow will be very important. We'll be dropping some hints for the test. So let's see who's in the lead right here. Now that we know how to calculate an expected count, that is going to be eager moose still in the lead with swift. Whoa. I think there was like a one point difference before. Holy mackerel. I want to know who these people are. If they keep winning. I mean, that's, this is insanity right here. Ooh, Purple Owl, you got my vote, Purple Owl, or Agile Llama. Stellar Stark, you're, Stork, you're awesome too. Next question, here we go. True or false, side-by-side -side box plus compare a categorical Y and quantitative X. Side-by-side -side box plus compare a categorical Y and a quantitative X. Mouse, not Side-by-side <laughs> -side box plots. Be very careful. Side-by-side -side box plots. Side-by-side -side box plots. Oh, I got the graphic ready. What do side-by-side -side box plots compare? What is the Y for side-by-side -side box plots? What is the Y variable of interest? For side-by-side -side box plots, what is the Y variable of interest? For side-by-side -side box plots, what is the Y variable of interest? quantitative 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 so it's a reverse the the question is a reverse of the relationship it's quantitative y you see here zoe and categorical x remember don't don't feel bad if you get it wrong just remember that box plots are usually a, a quantitative variable and then we'd be splitting them apart based on a categorical x uh this question right here would probably be logistic regression which we haven't done yet but usually we think that the y variable of interest for box plots is quantitative and then you split it across an x variable where it's categorical sets so a reversal that's a good tricky question right there because it is categorical quantitative but the y variable of interest is a quantitative variable for box plots and then we split it apart into multiple groups right there so really tricky one but what's the game pins right behind me right there? It's 3303622. Thank you, Zoe. Join in. So who has a screenshot of this right here and has looked over it? Or another good thing to do is write it down. Like try writing this down again and knowing the big ones like histograms are for quantitative Y variables, box plots are for quantitative Y variables. And then you see how we can break them apart down here with side-by-side -side box plots and stacked histograms if we use different categories. Try writing these down or take a screenshot of this. Uh, writing it down is really where you get the knowledge, just replicating it and trying to remember these things. So that is good practice. Don't worry if you're getting them wrong. We're here to practice. Next question. Here we go. Ooh, Eager Moose and Swift Condor, but my bet on Purple Owl was right. Next question coming right up. True or false? Scatter plots compare a quantitative Y and quantitative X. So using that graphical analysis again, what are scatter plots? Hopefully we get a lot of right answers on this one. Let me ask you this. If we had two categorical variables, how would we compare them? If we had two categorical variables, how would we compare them? The graphical display for two categorical variables is what? Yeah, that's what I like to see right there. That's what I like to see. I was, I was, wor I was not worried. I shouldn't say that. I, I was scared that, uh, that I don't know. Don't worry if you got it wrong. What is, what reminds you of this? And great job, Hunter, right there, and Hudson and Meath. The scatter plot is two quantitative variables. A mosaic plot is two categorical variables or a contingency table. You actually saw a contingency table earlier when we looked at the drop rate. Contingency table, yes, Andres, great answer right there. Contingency and mosaic go hand in hand. The mosaic is the visualization of the groups where or the, like the within the X and the Y, where the contingency table shows the values, which was the question number two, the dropped calls with the provider. So a scatter plot, we can do what with scatter plots? Where we have two quantitative variables, we can then do what with this? Like, what do we do with scatter plots? We, we bring it open for bigger ideas. Scatter plots can be used for what ideas? Like bigger ideas. What do we start doing with scatter plots? What do we start doing? Why, why scatter plots? Where do we go? Regression, put a line to it. That means regress a line to it. We can do regression. We can do correlation, talk about linear correlation. So regression and correlation are all based on scatter plots, which are two quantitative variables, which is the first condition of QQ straight enough, no outliers plot doesn't thicken. 
Next question right here, Eager Mouse and Swift Condor, but you got Purple Owl and Gentle Wallaby and Fabulous Duck. I'm voting for Fabulous Duck now. I like your name. Next question, here we go. True or false, histograms display a categorical variable. That graphic just a second ago is gonna be a huge thing. This chart is on your cheat sheet, yeah, definitely. Knowing how to display stuff and why is important. Histograms display a categorical variable. Can anyone tell me a variable you would display in a histogram? If you run hist on something, ooh, ooh careful. Histograms display what kind of variables? Histograms display what kind of variables? Number of wins. So histograms display what kind of data? Quantitative, quantitative. If you have a categorical variable, you would display it in a what? A categorical variable should probably display, be displayed in a what? A categorical variable should probably be displayed in a what? Look there at the top. Categories are generally or probably shown with what charts? Bar charts. Bar charts are probably your top display for that. Bar charts all the way at the top. Histograms are quantitative. They're like a lot of times, they would make a, they would, I saw a lot of them. Who made a histogram and a, cause I did it during office hours. So people use that code and what it, were people happy with the graphics they made? I like, I like making nice graphics. And I saw people made the histogram with the bo box plot underneath with, I think they did the uh, GG arranged or the combined, uh, but are the patchwork. There's different packages that let you do it. But some people had some really nice graphics with a histogram and then a box, uh, a box plot underneath it. And it's like, Hey, this looks pretty nice. Uh, we did it during one of the office hours and then you can just use that for other assignments. So like, let me just change the variable. Is anyone doing that where they just change the variables for the assignments where it's like, Oh, I've got this code that makes this histogram in this box plot. Let me just change my data frame. Let me change my variable. Good to go. That's a lot of coding is copy pasting. So. If you're stuck on something, just let us know. Start early and just let us know. I was talking to a person about the take home today. Shouts to them within the same assignments too, exactly. So you get a good graphic. You like the way it looks. You change the data frame, you change the variable. New graphic right there, just like that. You write something good, keep it. So histograms are for quantitative data where bar charts are for categorical. Continuing on to the next question here. Eager, oof, this leaderboard, but don't leave. Remember, we're reviewing. You're about to see some big review coming up here in a second with the next question. What is the best way to investigate normality? How do we investigate to see if the data is normal? And why would we do this? How do we investigate to see if data is normal? This is a throwback question to something you saw earlier. What is the best way to look at normality? There's an answer here that does not apply. The answer that does not apply is scatter plots because that's a bivariate relationship. The, don't worry if you answer these. The next answer I wouldn't pick is a box plot because that hides the way that things look. The best answer for normality, great job, is a QQ plot for normality. Scatter plots are used to look at bivariate relationships. Histograms, they're not the best. Histograms are decent. I should have a question mark on that. Uh, QQ plots for normality. When does a QQ plot for normality look normal? And this is going to be big for the check regression, which is kind of the new stuff. The QQ plot for normality looks normal when you have a red line and what happens when it looks normal. You'll see a few of these coming up later on. You have a red line and with the QQ plot for normality, the quantile quantile plot, when the dots are within generally, and if there's one that's out, it's like, eh, depends on how far it is out. You kind of look at it and you go, here's all right. Two statisticians might come to different conclusions, but there's some that are clear and some that are kind of iffy. It's like you go to a pizza joint. If the pizza joint is serving you cardboard with tomato sauce on it, everyone's going to hate that. If you go to a New York City pizza joint that's got the best pizza in the world, most people should like it. We can't promise you every statistician is going to look at a QQ plot and think the same thing, but there's some we have very strong agreement on. More on them later on. So we'll see some of those coming up here, but the leaderboard just had a huge shakeup. Fabulous duck, fabulous lead. Jump right up there to the leaderboard. Let's do this on the next question. Here we are. If the relationship between two variables is monotonic and linear, which option should you pick? Monotonic means it goes in one direction. Linear means it follows a line. So remember, it is monotonic and linear. Now, if things are linear, they actually have to be monotonic. Because look, here's a line. See this? And hint, I'm not blocking a right answer. So if it's a line, it has to follow it. Now, there's only two choices you can pick from here. What are the only two choices between two quantitative variables where you're looking at a linear monotonic relationship? The only two plausible choices are what it, wow. 
The only two plausible choices were what or what. I am super. Let's throw another thousand points. I love it when we get that many right answers. That's awesome. The only two plausible answers were what? The only two possible answers this one were what? Pearson or Spearman. We're talking about correlation right here. So, you know, there's a linear relationship. And then um, that's what clues you in on Spearman. I mean, Pearson. <laughs> so Pearson is linear. Monotonic, which means it goes in one direction. Like it constantly goes up. I'm making an S right here. If you can't tell what I'm doing, you're like, what is Brian doing? He's making an S. Spearman, if you think about the shape of an S, goes in one direction. Spearman has to constantly go up or constantly go down. It can't go like up and down. That's where you would use neither of them. Comparing means or medians is when you're doing different groups. When would you compare means? When the data is what? When would you compare means? Like how would this question look if I wrote it like, when we're looking at the relationship between different categories and a measure of central tendency, which is like the center, then if we have normal looking data, we would use the means. If the data is skewed, we use medians and the QQ plot comes back showing non-normality. So skewed data compare medians, non-skewed data compare means. And then for the Pearson versus Spearman, linear is Pearson. But if there's issues like outliers or heteroscedasticity, which is plot thickening, plot thickening from set to one, um, but if there's issues with it, heteroscedasticity, plot thickening, or nonlinearity, like it's curved, not curved like this, not curved like that. Parabola, parabola, what's the answer to parabolic relationships? If I tell you there's a parabolic relationship in the data, then what's the answer to what we use? The data has a parabolic relationship, Spe Pearson or Spearman? Trick question. The data has a parabolic, oh, careful, has a para parabolic. The answer is... Neither, neither. Because the requirement for Spearman is what? The requirement for Spearman is what? What is the one requirement? It can have it can have outliers. That's not a requirement. It's outliers, whatever. Heteroscedastic, whatever. Not linear, whatever. Monotonic. So a little bit of a trick up here on this one saying it's monotonic and linear, but a line is a line goes in one direction, a line goes up or down. So um because it's linear, I'd go with Pearson. Lines are monotonic. But if it was non-linear, I'd go with Spearman, as long as it is monotonic. So remember, the requirement of Spearman is monotonic, meaning goes in one direction, goes constantly up to a certain degree or constantly down to a certain degree. Great work and great job reviewing that. Remember, hang out for the knowledge. Great job right there. Three players just hit a four answer streak. You got this. Next question. Let's do it. What is the lowest possible p-value? Quick answer question right here. Remember, p-values are probabilities. So that should be a pretty easy one right here. P-values are probabilities. I'm just going to hit my glass. Knowing that p-values are probabilities will clue you in on the right answer. You see some interesting values here, like one and negative one, which are the possible values of correlation. Correlation can go from perfect negative to perfect positive, ranging from negative one to one. Uh, both of those are the same exact strength. They just go in a different direction. 0.05 is the classic value we use for p-values to find statistical significance. And a lot of people knew that the lowest possible p-value is zero, basically saying your results are impossible. Technically speaking, if you observe a result, it has to be possible to occur. We just sometimes estimate p-values to be about zero. So technically speaking, p-values could never reach zero because of the probability of your results, results from extreme occurring by random chance variation. So your result has to be possible. So theoretically, the lowest theoretical p-value is uh, approaches zero. Good job right there. We know about some p-values. Leaderboard going crazy. Gentle will be great job. True or false? Correlation implies causation. Oof. You'd love it if you got this on the test. You'd love it. We we vary. Some questions are easy. Some questions are hard. There's a lot of words we don't like in this class. What are some words we don't like? One of the words we don't like. Don't worry if you get it wrong. Free? Oh, there's no free lunch. We say that. Correlation is not causation. Yeah, that's false. False as false could be. We don't like to say things like prove or will or must. Statistics is all about being very sort of what in what you're saying. Think of the U word I like. It's so weird. Stats is so weird because it's like we never want to be certain. Um, It does have a calculator on it. I'd bring your calculator. It's not tons and tons of math. We have a lot of uncertainty and we talk about that. We'll be showing some confidence rules later on here in just a moment and we'll be doing some calculations. So you'll, you'll see some of the calculations. The calculations you see here are similar to the calculations you need to be able to do. So... Get ready because you need to have your calculator out because these are 30 seconds and check out the review on these if you want to review. But 
There's going to be a few more calculator questions coming up here very shortly. We don't like to say prove, cause, will, must, uh, no. We like to say uh, evidence, expect, probably, uncertain to this degree. We like to give a measure of uh, a boundary about what we would expect to see. Next question. Here we go. Doing great on time. Going to end probably at the one hour mark. Swift Condor, great job. Doing amazing. And so are you, Eagle Ma Eager Mouse, but I, I just like Purple owl, owl. If I had a Purple Owl, that'd be amazing. Next question. The model used as a starting point to compute the sums of squared error is called the what? What is that model called? That model looks like a flat line. It's like if I said, go out and predict people's heights on campus. And you said, I predict people are 5'7". And I said, why 5'7"? And you said, because 5'7 is the mean. All you said was just predict people's heights. What if I said to my students, historic data shows that people make on the midterm in 80. I predict you'll make an 80. I don't find anything about you. I'm using the what model. If I say, historically, the midterm average has been an 80, I predict you'll make an 80. Say, why, why are you doing that? Well, I don't know. The average is an 80, so I guess you'll make an 80. That's what I guess. My best guess. I'm not taking in, I'm not taking into account any information. I'm not asking how long you studied. I'm not looking at your grades. I'm using the what model right here. I'm using the what model. I have no knowledge. I'm Jon Snow. I'm the Jon Snow of models. I am the what model. The naive, the naive model. It knows no X's. This model knows no X's. This model right here is just what do you predict people will make on the test well the average test was an 80 so i predict people will make an 80. but if we look at something like how long people studied that would be an x variable in the model and have an xy relationship which would create a slope the naive model the mean of y is a flat line and that is our starting point for calculating the sums of squared error so that is the naive model naive i like to say in that word this 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 is one for the ages this is insanity. I don't want to be careful. Like you could click and I could delete someone. I don't want to do that. This is insanity. That this is a eight point difference. Let's continue on and see what goes. This is I'm still rooting for purple owl, but holy mackerel. Next question. Let's do this. Which of the following is not a condition for regression? Talking about this just last class. Which of these is not a condition for regression? These were the three conditions you saw on the screen. Remember, this is from the check regression output, which I said is on the test. Very important why it's in the Kahoot. Remember those three things you saw? You'll see them again next class. We'll be talking about it a little bit more to start class and we'll get into some fine transformations to help out with the take home. The three conditions are in order, linearity, which means we want it to be a line. We also want there to be equal spread and the residuals should be normal. Randomly selected data is kind of an assumption, but the conditions that we have to follow that we can check, like you would assume the data is randomly cl collected, but we don't actually run a test and check the condition that is met. So when we run check and check regression, we make sure we have equal spread of our model. What is it called when it doesn't have equal spread? 5,000 points for my big fancy pants word and everyone trying to spell it. Drop my big fancy word in the chat for when the model goes like, or goes when it goes like, has non-equal spread, the model switches its spread. It has differing spread, heteroscedastic, heteroscedasticity. So hetero meaning different, homo meaning same. Homoscedastic models have same spread. Heteroscedastic models have differing spread. So when we talk about a heteroscedastic model, it has a differing spread. Homoscedastic model would have equal spread throughout, same spread, homo, same, scedastic spread. So that's just the fancy words for equal spread, or sometimes people call it the equal variance condition. Um, but with this right here, linear, that's like super duper important. We're fitting a line. So if you have a linear relationship, last but not least, the normality of the residuals, they should follow a normal pattern. And I'm going to be dropping some huge hints tomorrow. Or did I show the equations right here? Might write them out at the end. You know what? Let's write it right now. This is a huge hint. Write this down. I'll be showing it probably tomorrow too. I'll look over stuff and I say, you know, I want to make sure you know this. This stands for right here. The residuals are approximately whatly distributed. 
The residuals, this equation means that the residuals are approximately whatly distributed. Each three components of this means something right here. The residuals, that's the notation for residuals, are approximately whatly distributed with the first thing. Approximately normally distributed. So they have an approximate normal shape. The easiest one to understand next is actually the third part of it. The third part of it is when you talk about the normal, the normal has a mean and has a standard deviation. Now, if the standard deviation is one value throughout the model, that means it has what spread? Like we're saying the residuals are approximately normal with a mean of zero and a standard deviation that is constant. So what does this mean right here? The third thing right there, not the second as I write it, means what conceptually that it has one spread. So think about this, a model that has about the same spread throughout, that means the deviation is about the same at all points. There's not a differing deviation. Like the residuals are centered around zero and have about the same standard deviation at all points, like have a constant standard deviation. What is that right there? What condition is that? This is huge hints for the test. What condition is that? That's equal spread. So that's equal spread because the standard deviation is, does that make sense? The equal spread is the, the standard deviation around the model. Like the spread, do you see how the residuals have equal spread right there? If the residuals didn't have equal spread, they could do something like this right here. And now the standard deviation is not constant around the points. But if something has a residual of zero, if something has a residual of zero, where is it? If something has a residual of zero, where is it? If something has a residual of zero, where would it be? It'd be on the line. And now we're not talking about all residuals are zero. We're talking about the what residual throughout the model is zero. Look up there at the top. We're not saying all the residuals are zero. We're saying the what residual is zero. We're not saying all the residuals are zero. We're saying the what residual is zero. Um, it'll say, Jackson, if you feel like something count off, let me know. If you ever feel like you're unfairly, I, I give points back for decimals if it's small. We're not saying all residuals are zero. We're saying the what residual is zero. The mean, the average residual. So how would you tell the average residual? Well, kind of look at your data right here and look at where it averages to. Like, here's where that would average. 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 Ooh, that one averages to the line. So the idea of the average residual being zero is that the line goes through the what of the data. The idea, which would be properly shown right here, the idea of the average residual being zero would be that the line goes through the what of the data. The idea that the average residual, if you were to average them throughout the model, the idea of the average residual being zero is that the line does what? Because if you take the points and average them, they should average around the line is that the line goes through the center of the data. At this region right here, the average residual is not zero. Does that mean that's one site it all uh, runs stuff like, oh yeah, we don't have a site like that for our class, I'm sorry. And I'll be releasing a practice exam, I believe here at the end. Sorry, I don't have a, I should make a BS320 site. I made the statue one site and that's really helpful, but we have the stuff posted to Canvas. Good question, Charles, right there. We have the Kahoot too. Uh, I just don't have a site for the, the we have the class videos and stuff, but I actually have a BS320 channel, which I don't use. I just, it was, I had two channels and I was like, I use the tool, the tool one all the time. So where's a B, there's a BS UTK320. Check it out. Going on here to the next question. Let's check it out. This is a third. I've never seen this. I've never seen a 13 point difference. Next question. Let's check it out. Here we go. True or false residuals should be independent. What should residuals show you? What should we see in residuals? What should we see in residuals? I'm not blocking a right answer. <laughs> so often as a hint, I try not to block right answers if I appear on the screen. So if you're listening in, that's a huge hint. What should residuals look like? Residuals should look completely what? The residuals should look what? They should look random and show no pattern. So that's why we say they come from a random normal. 
So they come from a random normal, like they're just random normal. So the randomness is kind of implied. So on the last one, you say, well, didn't you say it's not random? Well, the pattern of the residuals should be random more normal. So the normal is more important. They, they shouldn't be like random uniform. The distribute distribution should be random normal. So residuals should be nothing at all. Think about when you think about what's residual, residual means like what's left over. So if we have what's left over, our model should explain what it can. And then what's left over that it doesn't explain should be very what? Like the line is going to explain things. And then what's left over should just be what? If you want to say the word again, whatever's left over that we didn't explain should just be what variation? Because we it's the things we're not explaining. So it should just be things we can't explain, right? So it should be very what? If you make a good model, the residuals should look pretty what? Because it should be variation you can't explain, which is going to be this. Same word. So the residuals should look random. Exactly. That just means like, we can't really explain these. They're just random, which is good, which is good. That means we took all the information we could explain. Does that make sense? You say, well, why do I want them to be random? That means I got everything out of it I wanted. And then I can't do anything else with this. That's just random stuff. I'm just saying that's just misses. I can't make a perfect model. It's weird. Stats is weird. Ooh. It is a 14 point difference. I would, it is 14 points. I'm throwing 2000 points for these Titans of statistics at the top of the leaderboard. I, I'm still rooting for you. Purple owl, fabulous duck and amusing squid, but never before have I seen a battle like this. And I'm going to be sad if one of them falls off the leaderboard. I'm going to be excited when purple duck, purple owl wins, but here we go. And fabulous duck. Let's continue on. Next question. What is the uncertainty of the slope? Nice job, Olivia. So what value right here is the uncertainty in the slope? And then we're gonna do a calculation after this, so stay tuned for the calculation. Which value here is the uncertainty in the slope? Check out the video we were posting in class last time for the review of every little bit of this output. What is the uncertainty in the slope? Which value? I can't appear on the screen. <laughs> Great job. Really great answers. Uh, the uncertainty in the slope is the standard error. Just think of whenever you hear standard error, think uncertainty. So what is the residual standard error? Like I know re residual standard error is also known as what you can tell me the four letter acro acronym, or you could reinterpret it by saying our uncertainty in the this. So residual standard error for it's the RMSE. Great job, Andres, right there. That is exactly, it is the RMSE. That is the root mean square error. Like those, it's just calling a different name for some reason. And Jackson awesome work right there too. So the residual standard error is the typical miss the model makes, which is the root mean square, error, which is our uncertainty in the residuals, which tells us about the typical distance our residuals are away from the line. So also what you see right here is the estimate. Could anyone write the regression model right now, which was on your last assignment? You can just write it. I, I guess you could write meet weight. You could write MW. This is the EX3 abalone data set, example three abalone data set. Can anyone write the regression model really quickly just for practice to be like slope intercept done? Just like y hat equals um, b0 times b1x. It's just practice right here, knowing this output. Like you should know this output pretty well by now. So what is the regression model? The regression model will be meet weight equals negative 2.6 plus 1.09 times diameter right there. There we go. Know how to do things like that. Great job. And then yep, you can sub in the, so what does this mean right here? Well, diameter is inches and we're predicting the amount of meat weight in pounds. This is a very important question and I am grading the midterms. We're gonna take a moment right here and I want you to interpret the coefficient of diameter. Don't worry, don't worry. Yeah, you do abbreviate meat weight. I just abbreviated it, that's fine. Um, interpret the coefficient of the slope. That's the uncertainty. I'm gonna ask two questions on this. One is interpret the coefficient of the slope. So interpret the coefficient of the slope. Be very careful. This is where people make mistakes. And you're predicting the meat weight of a fish type preacher. Mm -hmm. That's why I often say Robert there. Good work, good work, Robert. This is the meat weight you're predicting of a fish-like creature. So the context is we are predicting the meat weight of a fish-like creature. And diameter is in inches. Those are fair questions to ask. And as long as you give decent content. For a uh, close, John, this, I probably, I might give you 3.5 out of four. 
Uh, it wouldn't be for two diameters. Switch, John. Really, John, two thousand points taking a stab at it real quick right there. John, that looks pretty good. Uh, I might give you. I'd be debating three point five or four. Let me read it because that's really close. For two, change it. Look, maybe we change it here. That differ by one inch. We expect the meat weight to differ by one point oh nine with larger. Close. So the amount of meat weight we get from it, because this is like farming stuff right here. It's like we're we're taking this fish and we're taking the meat out of it, the weight of the meat we get from the fish. Really close. I'd probably give 3.5 or maybe four, because you basically did it. Anyone else want to take a stab? I'll throw 2,000 more points if someone else takes a stab and tries to bring it to a little bit better. John, that was a really good, probably most of the points right there. For um, two meats, close. I, I, and Sophia right there, I'd probably... it's I. This is not a full question. It's not fully written out. I'd probably say these are fish from a fishing industry. So for, I would say for two fish that differ in their diameter, for two fish that differ in their diameter by one inch, we expect their meat weight to differ by 1.09 pounds with the fish that has a larger diameter expected to harvest more meat weight, more meat from it. Does that make sense? For two fish, meat, we got to throw you another 2,000 points. Thank you everyone right there for dropping those answers. Uh, I think meat has everything right here. Um, but Meath, Meath, you grab the intercept. Meath, oh, careful, you grab the intercept right there, Meath. Uh, so uh, you want to grab the slope coefficient. And the intercept is actually really not interpretable because it would be a, a fish that has a diameter of zero. Does that make sense why the intercept is not interpreter, interpretable? We would say for a fish that has a diameter of zero, the expected meat weight is negative 0.26 pounds of meat weight, which doesn't make sense for two reasons. You can't have a fish that has, has a diameter of zero. You can also can't have negative meat weight. How are people feeling and write these down as practice, go to the slides that have the interpretations and know how to do this. It's why I'm doing this right now. Do people feel pretty decent about those interpretations? Can anyone tell me the typical miss the model makes? If you want drop that in the chat right now, good answers for the take home. What is the typical miss this model makes? Like when I predict, this is the way we'd interpret it. When I predict the meat weight of a fish, I'm typically off by this amount. When I predict the meat weight of a fish, I'm typically off by 0.05 pounds. When uh, I am explaining the percent of variation, I would say this percent of the variation, I'm talking about what? What percent of the variation in the meat we get from a fish is explained by the diameter? What percent of the variation in the meat we get from a fish is explained by the diameter? We've basically done a lot of the output. 76.93, 76, that'll be the, that'll be the uh, right there. Uh, the, the residual uh, standard error is in units of the y i think that's oftentimes uh because some of them on the slides have interpretations as percentages the residual standard error is in is in units of the y so if meat weight is in pounds when i predict the meat weight we get from a fish i'm typically off by 0.05 pounds that's a common error i see is residual standard error is in units of the y because it's how far we usually are off in our prediction of the y so it's in units of y um last but not least here is this model statistically significant and how do you know that this is a huge part of the test, hence why I paused on this. Is this model statistically significant and do you know and why? And then I do have one more question. Is this model statistically significant and why? Yes or no? And how would you know that? I can't appear on the screen. Charles, that is the right number. Charles, that is the right number. Yes. Yes. And that is scientific notation behind my head right there that one why that one why why this one not that one why this one why the lower one why the lower one good job hudson right that is true and why the lower one it's the p-value of the slope the intercept is just an arbitrary point the xy relationship is the slope so the p-value of the slope tells you statistically significant uh, the T-ratio right here is the ratio of these numbers. 1.09 divided by 0 0.015 is the T-ratio. Last but not least, tell me the upper bound of a 95% confidence interval and what value do you times the standard error by, hint, 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 to find the upper bound of a 95% confidence interval if you're doing it in your head. One value, hint, hint, hint. We love those hints. Times about two, Shannon, you're right. So what's the upper bound? You can just do it really quick and be like, me about this. About that. One point one two, yeah. About. And you could double check your math, but one point one two about. That is correct. And all you're doing right there is timesing that by two and then adding it to the estimate. Because you're saying, well, I could be off by about this amount, but I'll just add to it. And what code? Uh, let me throw two thousand more points. Thank you everyone for pausing on this with me. Um, what code would get you those confidence intervals? 
what code would get you those confidence intervals that you don't have to do the work? And I can't do this on the test, but this is why we don't have to worry about being exact in our calculations if we're doing it by hand. Confident, exactly. Confident gets you confidence intervals for the coefficients of the model. So confident. I just want to say how proud of everyone I am. This is probably one of the best 320 reviews I've ever had. People are following along really great. And I feel like you know the output because that's the key to it is like, know what the code does, know how to read the output, know what any of these values mean, and just ask if you don't know what a value means. I'm going to take 30 seconds here. Ask about any number on the screen if you don't know it. Please let me know. 30 seconds are on the clock before we do the next question. What is Condor? A uh, confident, confident. Confident stands for confidence intervals for the coefficients in a model. If you want to know about any value on the screen, just let me know. Um, we didn't do adjusted R squared yet because that's for multiple regression. We don't do degrees of freedom. Significant codes. Uh, so that means the stars right here, like we are on the triple star, which means it's somewhere between zero to 0 0.001. So that tells you this is super duper statistically significant. I wish you put those stars down there too, but the significant codes right there tell you how significant it is. So usually you can just look at a p-value to see if it has a star. The T ratio right here is how we calculate the p-value. So it's actually these numbers divided. Like if you take negative 0.26 and divide by 0 0.006, you'll get the T value, which is a ratio. The P value is calculated from that. It's important to probably know that the T, the larger the T in absolute value, the smaller the P value. When would you have the highest, just theoretically right here? Yeah, you don't need to know degrees of freedom. That's just calculation stuff. Good question, Joey, right there. Um, when would we have the highest P value? When the T ratio is what? Or T value? Sometimes called T ratio. Um, the more stars, the more significant it is, the lower the P value. When would the T ratio be the least significant? When it's very small, right? And what do you mean by small? When the T is very close to what? And just think theoretically, great job, John, right there, zero, right? So imagine if you were calculating this right here. If you had an estimate of zero, then what would your T statistic be? So now you go zero divided by that. What is your T statistic now? So you'd have zero divided by that. Now your T statistic would be zero because it's the ratio of those numbers. And think about this, all you have is uncertainty. You think it's zero and then you're like, well, I don't know, it could be positive, could be negative, I don't know. And well, whoops, we should be talking about the slope here if we're talking about the model. Well, the intercept we think could be zero. So let's just do that to the slope. I don't know. Maybe the slope zero too. We estimate the slope to be zero. And then the T ratio now would be zero. All we'd have is uncertainty. So now all the P values here would be what? All the P values would be what? Wait, so it's small. Small means close to zero. They'd all be one because they are likely, this is just a random chance model. And visually speaking, this would be a model. This is how your model would look your model on an X, Y axis would have an intercept of zero, would have a slope of zero. More importantly, the slope, because that's the X, Y relationship. So it'd be a flat line and it would look like there's no X, Y relationship. Does that make sense? That's a little more in depth right there. Any other questions on this, please ask them right now if you have them. But uh, the T ratio right there, I sometimes call it T ratio is the ratio of those numbers. And it tells you a kind of a ratio of your estimate to your uncertainty. The negative doesn't really matter because that's just the sign of it. What you care about is sort of the absolute value right here. Hence why over here you see probability greater than absolute value. So negative or positive, we just care about the larger the ratio, the further it is away from zero. Does that make sense? Hopefully that added some more context for people. But um, this, the smallest possible T in terms of least significant is zero. The further away the T is from zero, the more significant it is, i.e. the lower the p-value. So the smallest T is zero, which would have the highest p-value one. T could go to negative infinity, but I think of small T statistics as close to zero. Good review. Really, this was a, that was a lot of the lecture. That's a lot, a lot of information. We just paused right there. So check that out. Went through a lot of that output. Gary, for some check regression coming up here soon. Let's do the next question. Whoa, we had to switch. Whoa, someone was a little bit quicker that time. Eager mouse, eager to win this game. Here we go with the next question in three, two, one. Here we go. What is the typical miss the model makes? If you were listening into that review, you should be able to quickly see what the typical miss the model makes is. We even mentioned it just a second ago. This is great help for the take home also because the take home does ask you typical miss the model makes. What is the typical miss the model makes? 
Fipple miss is known as root mean squared error. Another uh, way to say root mean squared error is residual standard error. Great job, man. I love it and great job. Don't worry if you missed it, but remember a lot of the answers I give right here, I try to have them and then review them. That's the best success I've found is to tell you some stuff, review it, review it, review it, review it, review it, review it, review it. So we do. Let's see the next review question here. But first, who's in the leaderboard? Whoo, eager mouse pulling away, but eager wallaby. Catch up to your eager mouse buddy right here. Here we go with the next one. Can we review the code on our late? Yep, this is recorded. You can check it out anytime. Here we go with the next question. What percent of the variation Y is explained by the variation X? Be very careful. Grab the right one. I bet you know which one it is, but make sure to grab the right one. Well, I should have done it a little more differently. I should have carried some decimals. <laughs> but you need to know when you're talking about R squared, R squared when calculated ranges from what to what? R squared when calculated ranges from what to what? Zero to one, yep. And then you have to times it by 100. So hopefully, nice job. Yep. Make sure to times the R squared. Uh, don't use the R squared adjusted. This is adjusted for multiple variables in the model. We'll see that when we start talking about multiple regression shortly, but that is for multiple regression. It's adjusted for more variables in the model. It is a penalized R squared, not on this test. So I'm going to stop talking about it, but it's just a penalized R squared, not on this test. Which one of these are you looking at? Which one of these R squared are you looking at? I just want to make that clear. Hint. Which one of those R squareds are you looking at for your R squared? The one that explains the variation in Y and the X. The multiple, exactly. Which is weird. You say, well, isn't that for multiple? I guess, yeah, because multiple X's, right? It's not a multiple model. It's just a simple model. But um, the multiple R squared is your R squared. It's just the R squared. The adjusted, more on that, coming later. So next question, let's do this. Whoa. And we got Purple Owl. Let's do this. Next question. Here we go. What is the correct way to interpret the slope? What is the correct start? Oh, what is the correct start to the interpretation of the slope? <laughs> I wrote these questions. What is the correct start? We were doing this earlier. Have this on your cheat sheet. Know how to do it. What is a word we don't like? Mebot knows some answers. Good work right there. Do not, do not do this. At most, I will probably give you one out of four points. If you're watching this right now, at most, because I would love to be in the NBA and I want all, I only want, I'm throwing 2000 points for a bad and wrong interpretation right here. You ready? Brian wants to be in the NBA. You'll see it here in a second. And I want a wrong interpretation right here. The ones that are going to have you lose points on the test. So I want to be in the NBA. And I want you to interpret the slope the wrong way. Interpret the slope the wrong, only wrong, 2,000 points wrong. Now, don't do this on the test. You're getting 2,000 points for giving a wrong answer right now. Give me a wrong interpretation here. And this is why it's wrong. You'll see why. Give me an interpretation of the slope coefficient the wrong way. Give me a wrong interpretation of the slope the wrong way. That's a pound, and that's an increase in uh, height in inches. I want a wrong interpretation. I want a wrong one. We'll see what we got right here. A little chill music while we chill out here doing it. Give me wrong interpretations. This is why we don't do this. I say, well, Brian, it's fine. I say, no. We This business analytics, we're very exact in what we say. We're very careful. We don't make it sound like we're overselling it. How do we interpret this coefficient here the wrong way? For every inch Brian goes, <laughs> close, close Brandon. If Brian gains one pound, he is expected to grow 0.07 inches. Man, that'd be cool, right? Shannon right there and Brandon, tag team duo right there. Google, Google, you're not here to help out. For each pound increase in weight, there will, oh my God, Zoe, that hurt Zoe. Zoe, earning another 3,000 points to round it up to 5,000 points. Zoe, that was like, oh, Oh no, if I read that on the test, I might give a half a point. You even threw a will in there. That will was really painful. For each pound increase in weight, there will be a 0.07 increase in height. 
I'm getting some cheeseburgers tonight. I'm going to be in the NBA. I'm just going to eat cheeseburgers and pizza. Because guess what? If I gain 100 pounds, I'm expected to do what now? Oof. If I were to gain 100 pounds, I'd be expected to do what? According to your interpretations. The wrong ones you gave me. Chunks breath. If I gain 100 pounds, I'd be expected to what? Because you say for each pound. So let me just gain 100 pounds. So for each 100 pounds, I'm expected to grow 7.3 inches. Wow. I'll be like almost 7 feet tall. I'd just be like, I can just finally dunk. Can't dunk right now at 6'3", but maybe it's 6'10". That'd be awesome, right? No. How do we interpret this? Two people who differ in their weight by 100 pounds, I'm using the 100 pounds, are expected to differ in their height by 7.3 inches, where the person who weighs 100 pounds more is expected to be 7.3 inches taller. Oh, I'd like to be Shaq, Brian. My dream. So did everyone hear that? We could do the one unit difference. If we do a 100 unit difference, I'd still kind of right, still right interpretation. But two individuals who differ by one pound are expected to differ in their height by 0.07 inches, where the individual who weighs more is expected to be 0.07 inches taller. If we do a 100 unit difference between two individuals, we could say two individuals who differ by 100 pounds are expected to differ by 7.3 inches, where the individual who weighs 100 pounds more is expected to be 7.3 inches taller. In the basic sense, we generally see people who, like, you could throw this on if someone's like, what do you mean? Well, generally speaking, people who weigh more are generally taller. Now, this does not hold for all individuals, because remember, if we visualize this, you can see not everybody follows this relationship. Can you type that in the Discord or this chat so I can, yeah. Two individuals who differ in their weight by one pound are expected to differ in their height by 0 0.0, what is that, 73 inches where the person who weighs more is expected to be taller. There you go, right there, we got it. Um, so, yep, two individuals who differ in their weight by one pound are expected to differ in their height by 0 0.073 inches, where the person who weighs more is expected to be taller. Keywords right there, do not say will. Uh, we don't like will here because that shows certainty. Um, you could say predicted, there's multiple ways of saying it. Um, I do a standardized way of saying it just so people do it properly, be careful. Do not say like will or don't use that interpretation there. That sounds like cause and effect, like for each pound you gain or for each this. Um, mathematically speaking, that's what the line does, but we're interpreting individuals in a population. The line is the expected differences between individuals. So it's what we would expect or predict for individuals. So make sure to know that. And is the last model I made, does it have a logical or illogical intercept? You could still interpret it, but is this intercept value logical or illogical? Is that intercept value logical or illogical? And the root mean squared error is when I typically, when I predict someone's height, I'm typically off by about 3.55 inches uh, because that's the typical miss I make. It's illogical because we'd be saying uh, when people weigh zero pounds, we predict that they're 56.34 inches on average. So it doesn't really make sense. How do we know if we're doing units of one? The 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 value here is set to a unit of one. If you times it by 100, you'd have to talk about 100 unit differences. Good question right there, Charles. The the value right there. So Charles, 1,000 points. Thank you for asking that. Sometimes I do a little advanced version of it, but probably use units of one difference. That value right here is for a one unit difference. You don't have to worry about changing it. I did it because, I don't know, 100 pounds, 7.3. Don't worry about changing it though. That is a one unit difference. No matter what variables you use, that's always a one unit difference. Like if this number says another number, or if this number says a number number, that's always a one unit difference. Does that make sense, Charles? And Charles, great questions right there. So that is a one unit difference. You don't have to worry about this stuff down here. You know what the rock says about it? It doesn't matter. That stuff down there, not a big deal. That's the one unit difference. You want to do hundred times by hundred. Don't do it though. Okay. Heading back, <laughs> getting my second win for the day. 50 point difference oh my gosh purple owl keep it up per keep it up purple owl next question here we go what is the margin of error for the diameter estimate this is a tougher one and we actually calculated it earlier i told you i dropped some hints i told you i dropped some hints Do you remember the number we calculated earlier Let's see if you'll get it Think back to earlier, you actually calculate the margin of error by doing two times it. Do we still have that output saved? I think we do. No, we don't. Oh, no, we do. It is 0.03. So that was a 95% confidence roll. And if you take this and you say, well, wait, I wasn't seeing this right here. 
and times that by two. Uh, subtract. Oh yeah, Robert. I think Robert's. Yeah, Robert. Wait, Robert. We got Robert. Let's throw Robert some five thousand points. Robert, can you go into a little more detail? Because Robert totally did it. Let me show you what Robert's talking about. I was going to show the second way right here because Robert's showing it with this output. So the margin of error is what? What is the margin of error? If we talk about margin of error for an interval, what is it? What is the margin of error? It's just what of the interval. Here's the center, here's the lower, here's the upper. The margin of error is what the length of the interval. Here's the length of the interval. So the margin of error is what the length of the interval. It's half the length of the interval. So if you want to know what the margin of error or something is, well, the center, and this is what we saw from the output, was 1.09, and the lower was 1.06, and the upper was 1.02. Now, in the most recent thing, you didn't get to see the center. So the most recent thing didn't show you the center. Um, we did have other outputs showing us the uh, standard error was equal to 0 0.015, and that's when you times it by 2. So this is all the output you were seeing that coincides, the uncertainty in the estimate. But people are showing in the chat how to solve this. How could you get the center of the interval knowing these two numbers? How could you get the center of the interval? How could you get that right there knowing those two numbers? How could you get the center of the interval? How would we get the center? Well, oh, ooh. I noted something I just noticed was wrong. Whoops. Sorry about that. There we go. Add them up and divide by two. The center, get your Andres right there. Divide by two, just divide them. So I noticed I didn't include that one right there. If you were to divide these right here, the number in the middle, really? Really? There we go. Number in the middle is nine. So doing it with the decimals, we would get 1.09. Mini, you'd go plus 0.03 right here and minus 0.03 right here. And we'll probably do a few more of these in class just to make sure everyone's seen a few of these. But remember, a confidence interval just tells us we believe the values is between here. And we've seen a lot of confidence intervals when we talk about the confidence interval for the p-value, the confidence interval for the slope, the confidence interval for the intercept. We're just trying to estimate what the true value is. So what am I saying right here with this interval? I am trying to estimate the true value of diameter. Now, what lets me know things you should know for the test? Voice crack. What lets us know that this is a statistically significant model? What lets us know that this is a statistically significant model? What lets us know right here that this is a statistically significant model? What would let us know that? Because we estimate the intercept to be somewhere between negative 0.27 and correct Sophia right there, good answers. Which interval does not have zero in it? Which interval, thousand point answers, which interval does not have zero in it? Which interval does not have zero in it? The interval that does not have zero in it, the slope. Because I think the slope is somewhere between like this and this. So I don't think the slope is zero. So we don't think the slope is zero. I'm 95% confident the slope's between 1.06 to 1.12. So yeah, I think the slope's significant. I don't think it's zero. Great work right there and excellent practice, everybody. Few more questions. Let's do this. We got a 50 point kahoot going on right here. So how was the math worked out again? Uh, you take the upper minus the lower divided by two uh, right here. I'm gonna drop it in the chat again, Charles. Thank you for asking. Upper minus lower divided by two, which is half the length. The length of that interval, I'll show it again real quick on the screen right here. Let me ask this. What is the length of this interval? So what is the distance these numbers are away from each other right here? What is the length of that interval? To get the margin of error, it's half the length. So what is the length of that interval? 0.06. So then what is half the length? What is which is the plus or minus on it? What is half the length? So then what is half the length? So the whole length of the interval is 0.06. And then half the length. Thank you, Charles, for asking that. Half the length is that. And that's the does that make sense, Charles, right there? So half the length of the interval is the margin of error. Half the length of the interval is the margin of error. So the it's the plus or minus. So 1.09 plus 0.03 is this. 1.09 minus 0.03 is this. The margin of error is half the length of the full interval. That's the full interval, 0.0, uh, 0 0.06. Half the length is, yeah, exactly. The, the, that's why I went back to that screen. Charles, Charles, we're throwing you 5,000 points. Please let, and Charles, thank you so much. Because if you ever have a question, ask it. Maybe a second drawing helps out. And if you don't, we can always like, I'm just glad you asked that right there. Please ask those questions. Anytime you have a question, let me know. Next question coming up right here. Here we go. 
the interval ha the intercept can have no meaningful interpretation i think this is a gimme question i hope it is let's get that 100 percent let's see if we can get 100 percent right answers on this because we've seen a few examples of this tonight when we were interpreting things like the height and weight the intercept can have no meaningful interpretation is that a true or false statement like when i said when someone is weighs zero pounds two more questions after this so get ready oh this is so very true so very true because right here when somebody weighs zero pounds it wasn't a trick question no meaningful means it's like illogical like when someone weighs zero pounds we expect them to be 56 inches tall well uh if you look at the model right here the data really doesn't go down to that that's kind of an indication too the intercept is way out of bounds of the model and yeah so it really doesn't have a meaningful intercept meaningful intercept means when we say it the phrase like when someone has a weight of zero we expect their height to be 56 inches on average it means it makes sense like meaningful means like oh that's something we would care about it'd be like rock knows it doesn't matter so that's an illogical or a meaningless intercept like it, we don't really care about it don't worry though we're here to practice so good work everybody oh did the top of the leaderboard we got the leaderboard not move I put the wrong answer on that one. Oh, the leaderboard didn't move. Oh, the meaningful can have no meaningful intercept. Yeah. So yeah, don't worry. Well, the leaderboard's locked up. Two more questions. Uh, the question worrying. Sorry about that, Jackson. Yeah. How many tests are failed? How many tests are failed? This is a review of last class now. I was worried I got that question wrong. It's like when I saw the leaderboard didn't get it right. I guess that is a weirdly worded question. I think if it's on the test, on the test literally. There are three conditions. Three conditions are linearity, equal spread, and normality. The three conditions are linearity, equal spread, and normality. What is our null hypothesis? What is our null hypothesis? This is a review of last class. If you look at these and think about null hypotheses, the null hypothesis for linearity is that linearity is what? The null hypothesis for linearity is that linearity is what? Just a four letter word. The null is that linearity is good. Oh, I just. <laughs> the null is that linearity is good. What do you think the null is for equal spread? Uh, heteroscedasticity is the second condition, Zoe. This is the second condition. There's a problem with heteroscedasticity. So that's the second condition right here. Check out earlier where we also talked about the notation for it. So. What is the null for there being equal spread, which is homoscedastic? Equal spread means homoscedastic. Also shown by, we did some notation on it earlier. What, uh, da, 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 da. here's where we talked about the equal spread right here in the notation. There's the equal spread right there. What is the null hypothesis for there being equal spread? Do we assume equal spread or do we assume not equal spread? And all you have to say, the null is that equal spread is what? The null is that equal spread is what? Just like I said, the null is that linearity is good. The null is that equal spread is good. What is the null for normality of our, of, our, of our residuals? The null for the normality of our residuals is that the normality is what? Same, same idea. The three of them are linearity, equal spread, and normality. The linearity of the X is the linearity of the model. It's the same redundant P value. It's zero and zero, but if it's, it'll be the same when you see it right here. This is the end of last class. Check it out. And we're going to go into more detail at the start of next class too. But the three conditions are linearity, equal spread, and normality. And also check out the notes we have right here and check out earlier. Uh, we went over a little bit in depth talking about the normality of the residuals, which is going to be analyzed via QQ plot for normality. The linearity, which shows us if the line goes through it, and the equal spread, definitely dropping some hints by knowing what this means right here. So that is the linear right there in number two, which we're talking about the points being centered around the line, which is the mean of zero right there. Check out the earlier question where we went over that. Well, zero doesn't equal fail. Good, good answer, Charlie, right there. Zero doesn't mean fail. It means that we what the null. I mean, so yeah, it does mean fail. Charles, thousand points. It does mean fail, but what does it mean? Zero means I what the null. A p-value of zero means you what the null. A p-value of zero means you what the null. I reject the null. So think about this. Linearity is good. Talk to me about that test. 
The linearity of the model is good. Give me a full sentence. I what the linear linearity of the model being good. Be, give me a full sentence. And then think about what that means. So you see that p-value right there and I say, linearity is good. And you say, I'll, I'll what that, Brian. You tell me linearity is good as your starting assumption. I'm going to, what are you going to do to that? Your starting assumption was that the model is, has a good linear relationship. You assume that to start. You're like, ah, eh, it's probably linear. I'll assume that. So why would you assume that? I say, eh, it's a good assumption to have. We want it to be linear. So I'll assume it's linear. It sounds crazy to do things like that in stats, but we do. We assume it's linear until we have evidence elsewise. And Meath is saying reject the null. So I would say I reject that it's linear. Does that make sense? Which is the null hypothesis that linearity is good. We reject the null hypothesis that the variables have a good linear. Boom, Zoe, right there. Let's drop you another 2,000 points. Yes, that's a great way of saying it. I reject the null hypothesis that the variables have a good linear relationship. Does that make sense? Is that a good or bad thing, Zoe? You're rejecting that they have a linear relationship. Is that good or bad? You're saying, I reject that these variables have a linear relationship. Is that good or bad? The idea of them having a linear relationship, you're saying, nah. Not if you want, no, close, close, close. Zoe, great answers. Bad if you're fitting a line, because you're trying to fit a line to it, so you want them to have a linear relationship. Really great, Zoe, 2,000 points. Great answer is saying, good practice. So bad if you want to fit a line to it, you want them to have a linear relationship. And if you want to have homoscedasticity, you don't want to reject that they have equal spread. If you want the residuals to be normal, like no outliers, no craziness, no weird things with your residuals, then it would be bad to reject that they're normal. So is this a good or bad check regression? This is the check regression output. And is this good or bad? It's very, very one of the two. It's very, very one of the two. And we're going to see a lot of output for this. It's super bad. Go check out that movie. This is horrible. This is all three conditions failed. In check regression, huge note to take, you want your p-values to be what? In check regression, because you don't want to fail your conditions, you don't want to uh, reject them. So you don't want to reject the conditions. So you want your p-values, a total flip of your mind right here. In check regression, you actually want what are p-values? When running check regression, because the null is that they're good, you want higher p-values. The higher they are, the better. You just don't want to reject them. We'll talk more about it next time by looking at some of the plots, but this is the big thing because a lot of output like this is on the test, asking you how many conditions are failed, what condition is failed, things like that. All three conditions are fail here. We fail linearity, we fail equal spread, we fail normality of residuals, and we'll be reviewing this next class. We got into it at the end of last class. So check that out. The higher they are, the better. They should be above 0 0.05. Woo! Wow, wow. This, I'd be quick, is really really close right here let's see right here here we go last question of the day after we fail the test what is the next step i know i haven't told you right let's see who gets it i'll be mentioning this next class the answer is what we need to know the output actually tells you. We will see if this, wow. How did people get, wow, great job, everyone. So let me just say this. I know this last question was a little bit far, a little bit because we're going to talk about this and look at the output more next class. So if you read ahead in the notes, this was kind of like the big one. There were three people in the lead. So Tiny Brian, you want to you tell them what we decided, what we decided, Tiny Brian? Is this me? Yeah, it's me. Guess what? We got three winners. <laughs> we got first place, Swift Condor. Or third place, $20 gift card. Purple Hour, 20 out of 20, $20 gift card. All three of you, $20 gift card, including Eager Mouse. Three out of three, $20 gift card. All of you, Swift Condor, Purple Hour, and Eagle Mouse. I'm Tiny Brian, and I'm out. Woo! So if you didn't hear it, Tiny Brian made the call. He made the audible on the field to give all three of you $20 gift card. Make sure to email me. Uh, let me know which one you were. $20 gift card for Starbucks or Amazon, your choice. But huge shout outs to all three of you. Amazing work, Eager Mouse and Purple Owl. 20 out of 20. Holy mackerel. And Swift Condor, amazing work too. This is a little bit different from the test because it's quick. Make sure you know how to write those interpretations for the slope, the intercept, the RMSE. 20 out of 20 is wild right there. So really great work. Here's the uh, tough questions we missed. The slope can have no meaningful interpretation that is true, or sometimes the slope has an illogical interpretation is true, uh, but no meaningful interpretation. QQ plots for normality are used to analyze uh, if things look normal or not. And 
And I will show this right here. If you run the check regression, which we're going to be talking about more next class at the start, you will see right here advice. If we have conditions failed, then we need to see if the sample size is greater than 25. And if the sample size is greater than 25, which this one is, we then look at the diagnostic plots over here. And we're going to go through the notes and talk about this output right here. And we're also going to talk about fine transformations. Fine transformations is not on the test but it is something on the take home and I'm going to show you how to do those. So have your take home out and ready to next class tomorrow. So, um, is everyone ready to do some class tomorrow? Find about some take home stuff. You bought, why are you here? I am everywhere, Brian. Why do I sound like tiny Brian? Great work, everybody. Brian was trying to find the music music over here. Yeah. Help with the take home tomorrow. Swing by class as Mubot beatboxes to the music. Woo! Swing by class, practice the material, let us know if you have questions. Brian's gonna grab some dinner and probably respond to some emails and discords. Till then, Mubot's gotta power down. Mubot's gonna be overheating over here in a second. Mubot! Woo! Tomorrow's the one class I can't attend because, of oh no! It will be recorded. Tomorrow will be recorded. So swing by tomorrow. And we will be there. Until then, bye for now, everyone. Bye. Woo. I'm back. I'm over here. I'm over there. I'm everywhere. I'm you, bye. <laughs>